Hi everybody, my name is Daniel Smon. I'm the CEO and founder of Cognata. I've been in the ADA space for the last decade, from training systems to actually validating and training it. And uh, today I will take the part of explaining how to use, uh, how to generate data uh, for training. So a little bit about my company, founded seven years ago, 50 employees today, we raised more than 23 million bucks. We're working with the five out of seven tier ones uh, of the world, and we're working with more than 20 customers and working with big companies like Qualcomm, Zedef, and others. So how do you generate data? So let's talk about the problem first. We have a new sensor uh, and you want to test it outside. So what do you usually do? You take your vehicle, put all the sensors plus a data logger, and then you're going into diverse environments and you need to collect in different weather conditions and different times of days, and then take this data send it to manual annotators and that's you know an activity that takes time and has issue with accuracy and sometimes you do not have the sensor that you want and you don't have it in the placement that you want so the way to bridge that gap is through synthetic data with our simulation platform so how do we do that we have four layers uh, of uh, building blocks for our simulation static dynamic sensing and data on the static layer, we're building full worlds, completely procedurally. We're using layers coming from uh, GIS layers for buildings, elevation maps for topography, and high-definition maps uh, for, the, for the navigation itself. Then the result is fully furnished synthetic worlds created in our cloud in a few minutes. So, you point on the place in the world that you want, and we are automatically generating it using map data. You don't need to see any vehicle outside, and you can drive in different places of the world. Okay, now we'll show an example of a, a, a more modern digital twin that we have created recently. So on the left-hand side, it's a city in Israel called Hoda Sharon. On the left-hand side is synthetic data from the Cognata platform. On the right-hand side, the real world. And you can see that it's quite similar. It's identical in terms of um, the geometry, but you can see some small differences in terms of like different trees and some small details, but generally it's the same thing. So we started with a static layer. We built a world, but this is an empty world. You don't have vehicles that are driving there or pedestrians that are crossing the streets or any other moving interaction. So uh, to add that complexity, we have a dynamic layer, uh, which has all the virtual agents. And we've created an AI traffic model, which based on a learned AI model uh, learned from real life. Uh, so it's a combination of reinforcement, mutation learning, and uh, intelligent driver. Uh, and what that you get at the end uh, is a very realistic traffic model. And so what you're seeing here, it's a semantic digital twin of Ayalon Highway in Israel. And you can see that each of the vehicles here is acting quite naturally, but this is not a replay of what that happened. Uh, what you're seeing here, it's actually live interaction of our vehicles uh, from their own AI. They would stop and accelerate or switch lanes independently on the other agents. So this traffic model, think of it as a particle model that can describe how driving uh, occurs in real life. So we have the static world, and now we have added to that also the agents that drives inside it in a natural manner. The third layer, and this is like when it becomes interesting, 
to our webinar today is the sensing layer. So we have a world with all the moving parts. Now we need to render it in different sensing, in different modalities like cameras, LIDARs, radars, ultrasonic sensors, thermal sensors. Um, and for that, we have the sensing layer, which using uh, synthetic rendering. And to do that, so I will show an example of a fisheye camera. What you're seeing here are four fisheye cameras. Uh, each of the camera covering around 190 degrees, running on a, a digital twin of a car park in the USA. And this uh, lens distortion, you see it, it's 190 degrees, it's one to one accurate with real life with actual mathematical models. So I can point on every, on every pixel and explain the ground truth behind it. Uh, and you can think about stuff like free space estimation, 2D bounding box, 3D bounding box, uh, instant segmentation, semantic segmentation, and others, but also semantic properties like whether this uh, uh, talking is occupied or not. And by that, creating very sophisticated application completely synthetically. Another technique that I will show here is a technique that is unique to Cognata patented technology. It's called DeepNet Inspired Sensor. And I'll explain what you think. It's like how to extend the realism of your sensor. So on the right hand side, you can see a real video. It's taken from the Kitty data set. On the left hand side, you can see a synthetic implementation of the same scene. This is not Cognata, it's called Virtual Kitty. It's an open data set. And you can see that it doesn't look realistic, not the vehicles or the trees eh, or the road. In the middle, it's Cognata. And what that we did is that we used deep learning to learn how to turn the patches from the synthetic data to look like the real video. So you can see that the DeepNet inspired sensor look like the real thing. And this, in, in that way, when you extend the sensor to look like the actual sensor, the synthetic sensor to look like the actual sensor, the last thing is a data layer. We have what we call a data optimization layer in which we are helping companies and it will be part of what we're seeing with uh, uh, the lectures of both uh, TensorLeap and Foresight. Yeah, only 20,000 images on an off-the-shelf uh, algorithm called YOLO. And the performance are quite good. When we're inferencing, a neural network was uh, trained only in synthetic data, only on 20,000 synthetic uh, images, and inference that on real data, you can see the domain gap when you are picking the data correctly uh, is actually minimized, and you can use and develop stuff completely Okay, another project that we are involved with and are highly promoting now is the collaboration between Cognata, Microsoft, and AMD. It's called Automated Driving Perception Hub, where we are bringing virtual sensors uh, to the cloud, which are actually certified by the sensor provider. Uh, this project is running on Microsoft uh, Azure servers, using AMD's GPUs. Now, the idea with having certified sensors on the cloud means that you can trust the sensors that you are having virtually to be certified by the actual maker, and then you can utilize them with confidence. So we will see now one or two examples from those sensors. We start with a thermal camera from Adaskai. Both of, by the way, on the right hand side, it's a thermal camera. On the left hand side, a RGB, regular uh, vision camera. And you can tell the difference quite uh, nicely between uh, the, the vision to the thermal. Here now you can see the pedestrian on the thermal and not on the vision. And again, here like with harsh weather condition, what you can do with, what you can do with thermal and what you can do with vision and how it extends your algorithm. Uh, we are uh, onboarding to this project many, many sensor providers from regular cameras, thermal cameras, 
LIDAR providers, radar providers, and more to come. So to sum it up, really, radars, LIDARs, long distance camera, all kinds of like lens stains and obstructions, omnidirectional cameras, thermal cameras, and other lens effects. And to pass the ball to my mates here, we're like actually um, helping with two kinds of use cases. The first one is training, providing data for training neural nets. And the second one is validation, testing uh, with large scale uh, from ADAS to autonomous driving systems. And as we said, we're targeting today training. So without further ado, I will pass the ball to your time. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Danny. It was great. It was inspiring. So we're going to speak today about applied explainability. TensorLeap is developing applied explainability platform that allow us to utilize advanced explainability techniques in order to improve many different uh, uh, places in the development process. And we think that there is a lot to improve uh, in our testing procedures. Many companies in the state, they, they, they are blinded to failures on edge cases since our huge test sets constructed from... Um, do you hear me? I'm getting strange messages. Sorry, guys. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> Are your test sets constantly failing, uh, constantly passing with 96% accuracy, but hidden failures on edge cases, since those small population will never impact the total accuracy at the end. Testing, the, the, the current testing techniques and testing uh, metrics are not generalization metrics. So it's very hard to estimate, to use it in order to understand if the model actually using uh, proper features in order to uh, validate those models for production. And there are, and once, even once we solve some of those issues, it's very hard to understand to keep track after all the failures that we constantly fixing for production and to make sure that then tomorrow model that you deploy into production are not having any regressions on those models too. And once those models failing some production, it's going to be very hard to explain our clients why they're failing, which features cause them to behave the way they're behaving. Um, and the process of fixing those issues of trial and error and creating a lot of experiments, it's very time, uh, time expensive. And it's very hard to prove when we actually prove the scenario itself or we proved something that correlated with this issue. And most of it is because of the data set situation. We have constantly a lot of repetitive and redundant information because it's very hard to understand which features the model use and what kind of samples counted repetitive. The huge amount of unlabeled data, it's a huge bottleneck many times as Danny mentioned because the process of labeling images is very expensive and most of the companies get into the point that they need to understand very well which samples they need to label at each point. And if you're labeling, labeling a thousand samples, it means that you're not labeling other thousand samples that you might need in order to perform well in production. And the, as we see all the time, when we combining data sets together, whether if it's coming from the real world, different cameras, different times, or from synthetic data, to bridging these domain gaps between all those data processes, it's a, it's a very hard problem that we need to improve dramatically on in order to allow the model to generalize legit features that it should use. Um, so here comes TensorLips. And what TensorLips is trying to do is to take those test sets and to split them to tens of different small scenarios. And we're splitting them to different scenarios by tracking after all the metadata data that you provided, and we're able to track after tens of different metadata. But most importantly, we're tracking after all the activation with your, within your model. We're calculating entropy, mutual information, and different indicators that can help us to estimate which features in which layer able to distribute the data sets in the most informative way. And then we're projecting the whole test set and the whole training set on those embedding space. And by different techniques, uh, creating unsupervised clustering and characterizing all those clusters to different insights on which kind of population you're tending to fail, what is the, the reasons for 
those clusters to emerge and which features those model use to get certain prediction. And from here, we're exposing different APIs that allow you to find those tests, to track after them, to bridge the domain gap between different test sets and to prioritize unlabeled data, and soon also to guide your synthetic data processes in order to improve dramatically their representation. So for example, uh, we took here uh, the Kitty data set and the Cityscape data set, and we found a few different domain gaps that got it. One were the differences in the colors, and the other one is uh, populations that has high veg vegetation. So in the kitty data sets, there is much more vegetation. And we can pull it, understand it quickly, and build a clustering algorithm that can find in unlabeled data the samples that will allow you to perform much better on those specific clusters. And immediately to check on all the models that you inserted the, the platform, if those models perform better on those use cases. Um, and I'll move the, the mic to our friend here, Evgeny, who can share a deeper use case of, of everything in our day using all those different techniques. Okay, thank you, Tom. It was very interesting. Okay, so I'm Evgeny, the head of algorithms at Foresight. And I want to talk to you today why demos go wrong. In the world of startups, it has occurred to everybody that you develop the product, the best product you can, you try to test it in-house, you try to validate it, to think of all the edge cases and everything works great. You get it just fine. And then you come to the customer and nothing works. In demos, nothing works. Why is that? Is that just Murphy's law or is maybe something different, maybe something related to the training data, to the main gaps. I am going to talk about that. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Foresight, what we do. So in Foresight, we, we, do, uh, we do stereo vision. Uh, we have several uh, end perception. Uh, one of our products is the scale cam which is stereo modular stereo system that you can uh, situate the cameras in different locations on the car. It can be in the uh, headlights or it can be behind the windshield or on the roof or wh wh wherever you want. It can, you can use wide baseline or narrow baseline. This, of course, will uh, influence the accuracy for short distance or for high distance, but uh, the system is uh, can be uh, modular, can be changed. Uh, and we work both with these cameras and infrared cameras. Another product we have is the mono to stereo. We uh, leverage the existing two cameras in the car. Many uh, car models have already today two uh, monocular cameras. One is the EDAS, which is situated behind the windshield. And the other one is the parking surround camera and the front Parking surround camera is looking is uh, situated near the grill, and we use those two cameras in order to produce a depth map or a point cloud and create opportunity for the car manufacturer without additional sensor enhance the safety features that he offers his customer. Another feature we have is the dy dynamical. Uh, which is uh, dynamic calibration, automatic calibration, uh, learning the position of each, the relative position of each camera on the fly without calibra calibration boards. And quad site, which is a multi spectral perception solution or other solution. Uh, it has two uh, stereo cameras, VIS and IR, two stereo pairs, and uh, this can uh, give you good. Uh, uh, perception capabilities in all weather and all illumination condition. Here are some example of our technologies. Of course, it's just a tip of the iceberg. Um, here it's an example of a point cloud um, from our system. You can see here up to 150 meters with uh, high accuracy. This is um, infrared point cloud distance map and perception. And this is an uh, example of uh, a distance map for, uh, on, on, the, on the fly uh, from uh, our system. 
And here is a use case for ag agricultural purposes. We mount our system on the tractor and uh, we can identify uh, any object or, or any obstacle using the point cloud and pl plan a path for driving the uh, agricultural vehicle. So again, it's just a tip of the iceberg of our technology. If you are interested, you can go to our web website afterwards or contact us. Okay, so the use case I want to talk to you about today is about detection. Why detection? Because it's simpler and everybody are familiar with this and I am using this as a example case uh, for the technology, but this is uh, can work also for uh, stereo or any other AI technology. Okay, so how do we collect a data set for detection? Um, first, we need to choose the recording scenarios. We, there are different surroundings, urban, highway, rural, parkings or paved street and uh, many more. Time of day, of course, uh, the illumination, different slope, uphill, downhill, flat surface, this all uh, influence the perception, <clears throat> different weather, if either it's sunny, rain or fog, all of these uh, combination, they represent the distribution of the data in the world. So we need, when we choose what to record, we need to sample everything, uh, all the combinations. Then we uh, send out our recording crews and we record raw movies. After that, we sample the movies in low FPS. Why low FPS? Because uh, frames that are adjacent to one another, uh, one after the, the other, they have low variability. And there is the what you see in frame number one is almost the same as you see in frame number zero or number two. So we sample them uh, with low FPS. We remove the red light or the places where the car stopped, uh, of course, because again, low variability. And we are left with uh, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of uh, uh, pictures. Uh, how do we sample from that? This is a good question because uh, first of all, we want a, a balanced data set. Second, uh, we want, want it to be uh, the highest variability possible. For example, if you are driving on the highway for one hour, but we, all the way there is some truck uh, in front of us, uh, all the images will look similar with uh, the truck having a, a huge part of the field of view. Okay, after we choose the, the, the images, uh, we send them for labeling. Uh, we measured the labeling time that takes our professional annotators to label an image, a frame. It's about 10 minutes per frame for this task. Of course, this is one of the fastest tasks because you only use bounding box. Uh, segmentation, for example, is much slower. Um, so you, uh, in order to get a good data set, you need uh, amount of frames in the, the 100s, uh, of images, 100, 200, 500 thousand images. So you can understand how much time and uh, money this costs. We tried to pre-annotate the uh, the images with known with teachers with best models we have. But interestingly enough, this not reduce very much the uh, amount of uh, labor required for each image because expert annotators uh, correcting the box or uh, uh, just making a new box, it takes the same time to them for them. Okay, so now we have a use case. For example, uh, our data set was uh, collected mostly with a 32 degrees field of view camera. We uh, put it on the rooftop. Uh, we collect it mostly mostly in Israel, but also in the Europe, in the and the in the US. Mostly dry weather, but also some rains and some snow. And all of these countries, they are driving on the right hand side. And now we have a customer. The customer wants to put a 100 degrees field of view camera in the headlights. So this is much lower. This is different perspective. So the cars, the near objects, they look different. Uh, and the customer is from Japan, so he's going to test our system in Japan uh, in, during winter time, which is cloudy, 
maybe rain, maybe snow, and they drive on the left-hand side. Um, and now you understand how uh, in demo, our system will not work as well as it uh, as it works on the uh, evaluation that we do. Now, what, what, what we suggest, what we uh, did, um, is we uh, ask the customer uh, to record a small sample of data at his location, and we compare it using TensorLeap system to our training data. So you can see that the target sample data, let's call it target distribution, and the training data, the training distribution that is marked pink, they uh, almost don't overlap. Also, one feature of the uh, TensorLeap uh, system is that explainability. So you can see that this cluster over here, for example, it represents night. And this one represents tunnels. This is here is urban. And this cluster is reserved for our target sample data. Okay, and important to notice that this is the distribution that our model sees because uh, you can use, uh, it's very much depend on the embedding that you use, but this is the way that our model is going to see it. So if it's out of distribution, out of the training distribution, that's bad news for us. Okay, so the, what we uh, did uh, is recorded sample data at customer, use TensorLeap platform to see if it fits into the training set distribution. So in this case, we see that it, it does not. Then we use Cognata for simulation. We simulate vast amount of data. Um, and then we go to, uh, of course, we use the configuration, the sensor configuration as close as possible to the customer, to the target distribution. Then we use TensorLeap to see that uh, our model identifies this data as coming from the same distribution as the target distribution. If it's so, we use it for training, for tuning, and deliver the model. This all to the customer. This whole process is very fast. It uh, is a matter of weeks. Here is an example of uh, two Cognata simulation using, of course, the relevant uh, ca camera and uh, uh, configurations to the target simulation. And we see that one of the, the yellow distribution, the yellow simulation, uh, did not fit uh, in the eyes of our model to the target distribution. But the green one, it did fit very well. And it also have representation in other areas that maybe we don't need as many uh, examples there. Okay, so this, those are examples of the simulation. Now, what we do is we use this, uh, we choose with uh, TensorLeap's tool, the relevant images, the images from this uh, cluster over here. Uh, and we use them for training. Uh, what do we need from the uh, from the data to be uh, as good as possible? We need uh, data from the customer from the target distribution, which we see that it's what happened here. Uh, we need it to be with en enough inner variability to efficiently cover the target population. So if all the simulated images are very similar, it's not good, but uh, you, we can see here that the coverage is uh, very wide. Um, and we want to choose minimum amount of data to cover the entire distribution. Why minimum amount of data? Because we want fast training and also we want not to overfit for simulation data. Um, and of course, uh, simulation allows us for accurate and consistent labels, which is very important. So in this use case, uh, you can see here the uh, performance of our detector on our test set, which is, as I explained, with 32 degrees and so on and so on. And the results are pretty good. This is pretty close to the state of the art. Uh, but when we use customer, the target data set, uh, we uh, get very big reduction on the results. So. Uh, and after training with the simulation data, we get results that are very similar 
to the results that we had in on the initial test set, but on the target data set. So uh, basically, we I present here there are three trade-offs uh, that are easy. Do nothing, which is what usually you do, and this is why demos fail. Uh, you have domain shift that you don't aware of, and you don't know uh, that your model is going to fail at, at uh, the demonstration customer side. So do nothing. Doesn't cost time, doesn't cost money, but <laughs> you fail. Uh, collecting real data. This take the data collection takes a couple of weeks. The annotation takes several months. Uh, if you collect 100 or 200,000 images, this will have severe uh, annotation uh, costs, as well as flying to the customer for a remote so site. So this will amount at at least $100,000. Uh, but using simulation, we can get uh, similar results in the, for a, a fraction of the cost. Um, so we reduce cost, we save critical time, and we reduce risk of failure during this process. Thank you.